Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I am just so honored to bring you today's episode. It's with the legendary luthier, instrument restorer, all around amazing person, Barry Colstein of Colstein's Music, and his one-time apprentice, now director of day-to-day operations, Manny Alvarez. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most talented artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing? How did it all happen? And ultimately, what can we learn from their journey? You can find all of these episodes Episodes and more on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can go watch them on YouTube. So go like, subscribe, download, leave a comment, and let me know who you want to hear from next. Before I bring you today's amazing episode, I'd love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You guys, I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now, of course. And the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% Spun Crush Rayon, and it keeps me cool and comfortable. They've been making clothing in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964, and the artwork is so unique. It's screen printed right onto the fabric and it looks like a piece of art. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code JAZZ15 and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. Next up, I'd like to thank Colstein's String Shop. I absolutely love Colstein's. They are doing amazing things for the bass community. They have two amazing locations in Long Island, New York and a killer online store. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10 and you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. All right, it's time to bring you today's episode with the just masterful, innovative, extremely kind and generous Barry Colstein and his partner, Manny Alvarez. So you're definitely going to feel the love during this interview. It was so much fun, so much history. Everything from Barry studying with the Fred Zimmerman and Oren O'Brien to him meeting Scott LaFaro when he was just nine years old. And we talk about the Prescott base, of course. It was so amazing just to hear Barry's story, you know, growing up in that shop with his father who was so kind and so generous to all musicians. And you can feel that feeling. If you've ever been to Colstein's Bay Shop or talk to them it's just like you're, you're coming home it's so amazing and then getting to meet and speak with Manny Alvarez he's incredible he's elevating even more Colstein's Bay shop I mean they just opened another location in Long Island New York where it's more of an interactive experience because they just want to share the joy of music and if you listen to the end of this interview they have another location opening I won't give it away you're really going to enjoy this interview without further ado here is Barry Colstein and Manny Alvarez wow Barry and Manny thank you so much for taking the time today I mean I really appreciate it. You guys are uh, legends. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Baby. Stop it. <laughs> um, okay, so we just get started here. Uh, okay. I've never asked this question before, but do you guys have any questions before we get started? Well, I do have a statement. I just wanted to thank you so much because I know we're going to get into the Musicians Relief Fund, but you have donated your time unbelievably, incredibly well. To, to interviewing some some of the performers that are going to be in this new series well and we I, really thank you from the bottom of our hearts it's really yeah. a pleasure and an honor for me and i love you guys i love i mean what you have done and cultivated for the community and the musicians is just uh as duke ellington would say beyond category so thank you <laughs> um thank you. well awesome i'll we'll just get into it and you guys can chime in when this is cool i don't think i've done a double interview yet so this is this is a first this is exciting um i usually like to start at the beginning so uh, i'm just gonna start there so barry did you basically grow up in the shop i was surrounded by it yeah i mean i remember well i can barely remember it when my father's shop was in manhattan my mother was the book keeper and you know I was a little kid she used to put me under her arm basically and take me into Manhattan and I'd sit at my father's side I mean uh uh I remember my father I it's a very funny story because my father was always into tools Sam was always into tools and innovation and things like that and there was a tool that came out in the in the 1950s it was called the Dremel tool it was Mm -hmm. a small micro tool but it was you know now it's commonplace they use it for hobbies everything like that but uh but my father uh, got it and he was using it on bow making and bow re- restoration. It was, you know, very innovative for the time. And uh, he had said, you know, I, I basically, he, he had said to me many times that someday this is going to be all yours, you know? Yeah. And I was think I was all of seven years old. So I, I took the Dremel tool out because I wanted to show it to everyone. My father's looking all over. He comes running out. He sees, sees me in the street with the Dremel tool. And he says, what are you doing with that? And I said, well, dad, you said someday this is all going to be all mine. You know? Yeah. Might as well have <laughs> it now. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, that's but great. yes, I grew up in this business. Um, I worked, you know, on and off with him when I went off to college. Um, I went in a different direction. You know, I went into business. I have a business degree, a mathematics degree. And uh, actually, I was going to go into naval architecture at mm. one point. And, uh, um, and just through circumstances with the with the war going on at that time, I couldn't transfer schools. It wasn't possible. And uh, basically, I was lucky enough that when I was a senior in high school, I studied with Fred Zimmerman on a scholarship. I, I studied with him until he passed away, which was, I knew Fred was part of our family. He was my father's teacher at Juilliard. So, I mean, you know, this was an incredible experience. And I think with the fact that uh, some personal situations I had with my brother passing away the same, basically the same summer that Fred passed away and then I was off to college. I gave up music. I stopped playing for three or four years or three years until uh, a Dr. Gottschalk at the State University of Albany heard there was a Zimmerman student and he needed a bass player and he came after me and I started playing and I got bit again. You know, I said, mm -hmm. I realized how much I really missed, you know, playing both electric uh, bass and upright bass. And at that point, with myself graduating at that, at, you know, that year, I made the decision. I spoke to my father and I said, I think I would like to come in an apprenticeship. But part of his deal was uh, as an apprenticeship, he says, you need to enhance your playing skills. And I was fortunate enough to study two and a half years with Orrin O'Brien. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and I went off and I, I played for a couple of years, uh, probably about 10 years professionally. I'm still a member of the 802 uh, musicians i'm <laughs> proud to say they made me a lifetime member this year you know oh, because nice. my age Congratulations. but I, I don't i the truth is i played the uh, long island symphony orchestra i did a lot of recording work i did rock work i did you know all the jazz a lot of jazz and uh and the fact is is that when my kids were born you know my daughter was born um between working in the shop and you know that taking up so much time and also the business started to change that the, the jobs weren't as plentiful mm -hmm. they were starting to get i felt like i was taking work away from my clients some of the clients and i decided to step back it was a hard decision but i decided yeah. to step back and that's really i stopped playing and, and in this business as you know <laughs> out of sight out of mind really quick i mean a lot of people don't even know i played bass you know yeah. but, uh, but the fact is i'm, I'm pleased to say that I was part of the brethren or sisterhood of yeah. basis, you know, and I will always be. But I, yeah, I grew up in the business and I had the opportunity I spent, uh, when I left college in this 1970, um, I spent about two and a half years doing apprenticeship with my dad. You hmm. know, I mean, that's uh, basically all I did was make new instruments, didn't do restoration. He had a very good concept that he felt that restoration was the best way or rather uh, new instrument making was the best way to learn tool skills hmm. because you weren't dealing with undoing what other people had yeah. done and the intricacies and the difficulties of restoration. And after that, then he brought me into the restoration aspects and uh, stayed with him. We kept the shop as a, as the two of us, a two person shop until about 1980. When we came, we opened up the shop in Baldwin and uh, which you've been here, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a fairly large shop in yeah. the, and I remember looking at my father and saying, Dad, where do you want your bow studio to go? And he looked at me and said, I'm not coming. And I said, what do you mean not coming? He says, it's your turn to fly. Wow. And then he turned to me and said, make sure I get my paycheck every week, <laughs> which I always did. Good. <laughs> Made sure. But he yeah. was, he was, and I, to this day, my father passed away in 1999, which is now 20, 22 years now. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I miss him every day because, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, he was a great father, a great mentor, and probably my best friend. And, mm -hmm. and the fact is, is that every evening I talked with him. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he gave me advice, and sometimes I took it, and sometimes I didn't. And which is a very strong correlation to what's going on with Manny now. You know, yeah. I feel like it's, it's the passing of the God, you know, to almost two years now. And uh, it's very similar. I mean, my father did not want to come here. He wanted to go back to it his first love, which was bow making. And with me handing, you know, giving the reins to Manny or Manny taking the reins, I should say, um, I basically have been given the opportunity to go back to my first love, which, you know, on a, on a much stronger basis, which is in making instruments and restoration. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
you you just brought up so many great points, Perry. Um, one that your that your father insisted that you play bass to you have to know the music, right? Know the musicians, know that lifestyle, uh, so that you can communicate with people, right? And know know what they need in uh, instinctively. And also another great point. Oh, there's a lot of them, but you know when when you experience loss sometimes the thing you love the most which is music and I, th I think everybody's experienced some sort of loss sometimes you just can't handle it and you just have to put it away um and then it almost always comes back like in your case it did as well it did there was no question you know it's uh, it's funny I, I was just in touch with Oren you know who I stay in touch with I mean I love Oren she is like what can you say about Warren yeah. O'Brien? But uh, I said to her, we were talking about it, and I said, probably the two things, or the one thing I'm most proud of in, as far as my career is the fact that I can say I was an Warren O'Brien student. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And I was very, very, I was, I was, I was very fortunate and gifted. And the fact that anybody that came into town, I got lessons, whether it be Bob Gladstone, yeah. who, God rest his soul, he was the principal of the Detroit Symphony, uh, formerly with the New York Philharmonic, he would come into town and give me a coaching lesson. Uh, I used to tell the story, you know, that I would take a lesson on a Saturday morning with Lauren, finish my lesson, and usually span well past an hour because she was part of our family. She was always so gracious with her time with me. And and if I had my car, I'd drive her up to Lincoln Center. We might have uh, hmm. lunch together or something like that. And then I'd leave her and I'd go to the Metropolitan Opera because George Andre was principal and George was also a dear friend. He'd give me a coaching lesson. And then uh, this almost lent itself to, I've told this story many times, but he put me into the viola section, into the back of the viola section to watch the opera. Hmm. And the conductor never noticed they didn't have an instrument. Oh my gosh. Like, which could yes. lend itself to the older jokes. Yes, I'm not going to go there. My sister's a <laughs> no, violist, and I, I. <laughs> I could go there. Yeah, um, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> and did you know when you were growing up, like it must have felt like you were in this family of great people? And it's hard pressed. We're hard pressed to meet like a sour, mean bass player, right? I mean, like most no. of, most bass players are, you know, sweethearts. So did did you have that feeling like? Wow, this there's feels no, great. I'm lucky. Or there's no question about it. I mean, uh, we just—I uh, was really honored to be part of Nick Nick Wells' uh, documentary. Yeah. Uh, and we and Phil and I did a segment. Uh, we did it separately, but it really coordinated together on Scotty. And the truth is, when Scotty used to come to the house in Merrick, to the shop there, I was all of maybe nine years old, so I wasn't smart enough to know or knowledgeable enough to know the greatness that was around me, but I do remember him being there. Mm -hmm. And I often say, not that I want to be older than I am, but I almost wish I had been older at that point to really have known him better. I mean, Scotty used to come to the house on a regular basis because Gloria, his girlfriend, lived in Seaford, the next town mm -hmm. over. So he used to come out and, and sometimes he'd have dinner with us and whatever, but I just wasn't old enough to really absorb what was going on. Now, you know, yeah. now, you know, like everybody else, you know, you've worn out the Vanguard albums, you know, three times over. That's yes. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, I'm going to ping pong back and forth. So, Manny, tell tell me your story. Because <laughs> you, yeah, um, you, you've you've uh, been king of the castle here, head of the shop for like two years now. Yeah, yeah, it's almost it's almost going on two years. Um, still definitely don't feel king of the castle. I, I still feel that I am so honored and so uh, grateful to Barry and to have him there, uh, to lean on him so much. You know, I, I've i been working with him for 17 years and um, on and off for, for those 17 years. And every day I'm learning something new and, and we're going through something, a new situation or a new restoration. Um, and it's, really uh, it, it's really incredible so i still feel super grateful um i definitely do not feel that you know it all revolves around uh one person we are a big team here 
Uh, so it's really a, about all of us and what we contribute. And as a whole, that's what Colstein is about. I started uh, 17 years ago. I walked into the shop. I'm a violinist. Uh, so I, I don't have that bass <laughs> background, uh, but I feel like I've been adopted into the family. That's definitely for sure. So um, I definitely know what you're talking about on the type of personalities that bassists are versus some violinists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's, it's a whole different world, uh, but I feel so honored to be a part of it. But about 17 years ago, I was renting uh, a violin uh, through the school and we had uh, a few people that came in with Colstein instruments and everyone in the orchestra wanted to play them. Everyone, everyone said, can I borrow? Can I use it? Can I play 10, 15 minutes? And it was so different than what the rest of us had. So uh, one day I came to the shop to go check out some instruments and I fell in love with a Colstein Amadi shop uh, model. And I, I, I played it, I tried it out and I was in absolute love. And my parents were like, yeah, there's no way we can afford this. I think it was like $2,000 or $3,000. Um, and they said that, that there's, there's just way too expensive. So. Uh, I unfortunately had to come back in and say, thank you so much, guys, but I, I can't afford this right now, but maybe in the future I'll be able to. And I was asked if I wanted a, a job, if I was interested in, in, in the back and sweeping and packing rosin and, and uh, packing different products. And I, I absolutely, I jumped at the opportunity. I said, absolutely. And Barry so graciously let me work off that violin I think it was like two or three years, Barry, or uh, I'm still working it off. <laughs> uh, I got to check your account, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check the books. <laughs> but I'm so happy to say that um, that I'm still, that is my only instrument that I own, uh, my, my only violin uh, and my personal, you know, that, that I use primarily. I've never traded in or went to a, another instrument. So for me, it was such a great experience when I walked in through the door to have knowledgeable staff, to see people that were uh, excited about what they do uh, and to know, uh, learn about the nuances of different instruments and why one may sound different than another and uh, to really experience a fine collection. So I took that on, I'm taking all of that and trying to uh, still communicate that with every client that walks in through the door, we want there to be a wow experience uh, and, and feel like they're part of the Colstein family. Barry would so often say to anyone who's uh, purchasing an instrument, he would say, you know, welcome to the Colstein family. And, and, and I didn't understand at that, at that moment what he meant, but what I now understand is that that is the beginning of a long relationship um, mm -hmm. where we're working together and making sure that the instrument is optimal and that any uh, questions or concerns that the player may have, we're there for them as a resource to help them in any which way possible. Oh, yeah. I've felt You know what, Kate, Katie, familiar. I just yeah. have to... I have to interject something and not because he's not going to toot his own horn. Uh, I am so proud of Manny. I Aww. mean, you know, he has fulfilled my expectations of where I wanted the shop to go when it left my hands and it's still going. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, considering he took over the shop uh, really maybe two, three months just before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. So it's it basically he got hit in the side of the head with the pandemic and he has come through this like a champion. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I listen, when I was his age in my thirties, I was out to conquer the world when I took over the shop from my dad and Manny's doing the same thing, but he's doing it on a much bigger scale than I ever thought about doing it. And I'm, I'm just loving every minute of it, a minute of it. And I'm so proud of him. I really um, am. It must be nice for you to just, you're just kind of sitting back and have a, a different perspective, right? Well, it's fantastic. You know, it's, I mean, I've been deemed the senior creative uh, consultant for the shop and he really has given me the opportunity to go back to being primarily creative. And that's, that's, if I could ask a way to finish my career, it's mm -hmm. very similar to the way my dad finished his career, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, hopefully I got a few more years uh, with me, but, uh, but the fact is I'm, I'm, he's given me an opportunity that uh, I couldn't ask for.
the better, really. Oh, that's awesome. So as thankful as thankful as he is saying to me, he is to me, I'm equally thankful Aww. to him. Oh, stop, man, stop. <laughs> that's the truth. Um, no, it's, it, it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely a symbiotic relationship where, um, Katie, I, I couldn't have done it without Barry. And well, without continuing ask, to do like, it, yeah. Did you have any any inclination about instruments, instrument building, restoration? You came... Yeah, I mean, I was around almost every aspect of it. So starting to working from the back, I slowly started to come and work my way forward and forward and forward. So I would do re repairs, restorations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, help with builds, uh, you know, and... and and cosmetics, uh, and then start working my way f further up to be helping clients and to do some evaluations. And then things start getting just more intricate and intricate during time. Mm -hmm. But I feel that I have had my hand in uh, every area of the business. So for me, I it, it doesn't I don't feel married to one aspect of it. I, I guess um, I feel like an all round uh, general uh, uh, knowledge guy uh, who uh, is really now starting to experience the 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 details of you know what it means to uh, build instruments in a certain way or do some high end restorations uh, mm -hmm. in a certain uh, in a certain manner where before I would just be you know assisting or, or doing certain things. Um, I think that, like I said before, and I, I truly mean that is we're a team here. Um, it's really about, it's not just me. It's not just about Barry. Uh, it's about the Luthiers. It's about the front office staff. It's about the client support professionals. It's about the marketing, the AV team. There's just so many of us that are together kind of you know running uh, yeah. uh running this machine and then we're just bouncing things off of each other to be able to move forward but i think that with barry being here still with the shop uh and being such a big part of it we still are are going to him and and still um getting his uh, ideas and his thoughts and it's funny because he mentioned before the story about his father and and, and how, how he would take some, he would listen sometimes mm -hmm. and he wouldn't listen sometimes. You know, sometimes it is like that. You know, sometimes I say, you know, Barry, it's just this gut feeling I have, I just gotta go with it. Um, and he'd be like, well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> we go through, we go through some uh, ideas back and forth, but it's nice to know that at the end of the day, we're working towards the same thing. Yeah. Um, so that is, that's definitely, uh, it feels, it feels really good. Myself coming from, my mother was from South America and, and Central, and my father was from Central America. And then having them uh, come up here, I'm first born, first generation in this country. Uh, my parents didn't, at the time, they didn't you know, graduate uh, college and everything, it was like a new experience. Mm. So I think that w not just, yes, Colstein's music, basis world but we also bring in just like what barry said what happened to his brother and uh and after uh, zimmerman passed away and uh, we bring in all these collective experiences that mm -hmm. make us and shape us and i think that that's how we affect the world and what we output to them so i think that um the colsteins is like is like a uh, is like a vessel that all of us collectively are inputting our own ideas and thoughts into sharing music mm -hmm. and our passion for music, restoration, building, appraising, um, renting these 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 really you know incredible works of art that that people can use. Oh yeah, and I, I'm always telling people like, oh, if, if you're anywhere in New York City, I'm like, go to Long Island. It's like, go <laughs> go go to the shop, and uh, I, I it's like Dis I call it Disneyland for for bassists. You walk in, and it's just beautiful. It's like you know you got the whole color going on, and then it's just like rows of bases, and then you got the back room. I have, and I feel you know I feel that familial vibe, and I, it's um it's not a lost art because you're doing it, but it's a cool old school way that you both learned by apprenticeship it's like yeah if you want to yeah 500 years ago if you wanted to learn how to make shoes you went to the cobbler right and it took right. many many years to get it just right, right. so 
that's a great experience uh, to experience life in that way just by learning watching doing asking um okay barry i i'm not gonna take up all your guys' time today but um would you mind just like briefly uh giving a little telling us a little bit about your father's story i mean i i read i know a little bit you know he was a pianist and but how did he get into this well you know what my dad was a very ingenious genius person uh he uh he was at, in high school he went to uh, brooklyn polytech technical high school in brooklyn and uh so he had an engineering background uh but you know the whole my whole family was involved with music my my uncle was uh, a violinist a sax player you know and my 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 aunt was a singer my my grandmother was uh, an opera singer or she was in that direction you know so the from both sides, we had a lot of music in this family, and, and my dad, too, obviously was a very talented pianist. He went off to Juilliard as a piano major, and as a piano major, they requested that he takes another, he doubled on an instrument, and fortunately, he chose bass, and who was his teacher? Fred Zimmerman, you know, mm -hmm. so that was the start of the story, yeah. When he got out of Juilliard, um, he enlisted in the during World War II in special services and in musical instrument as far as playing for the army and whatever and composing and things of that nature. And yeah, he was playing piano, he was playing accordion, he was playing tuba, he was playing bass at that point. And but my my older sister Linda um, was born at the time, and uh, he was given he was stationed in Brooklyn uh, uh, at Fort Hamilton, uh, which was. Uh, just it was right on the point of Brooklyn and Queens, and and basically uh, uh, they allowed him to live off campus or off off base, you know, because he he was married and, and he had a child. So he and plus the army was very good when they were not working for the army. I think even today the military uh, allows the musicians to do outside gigs. Mm. So he was he basically was gigging and he had his bow on the back seat of his car and he picked up some musicians. Someone sat on the bow. He broke it. He didn't have the money to buy another bow, so yeah. he went around to you know Eisenstein, some of the other repair people that were in New, New York, and they all said it was a total loss. He needed to buy another bow. He looked at this thing and said, "Why is it a total loss?" And he ended up repairing it. He showed it to Fred Zimmerman, hmm. and Fred looked at it. He says, "This is amazing work." And he came back to him maybe a month or two. Now my father didn't have a workshop. I uh, brought him a, a Barzoni bass that had been destroyed in an accident. Literally was in a bag. And he said, Sam, I have this. He says, let's see what you can do with this. Wow. And he took several months, you know, no tools, no nothing, really. He, you know, everything was jury rigged and restored the bass and brought it back to Fred. And Fred looked at this bass and said, this is amazing work. And he said to my dad, he says, you know, you're a great musician, but you're missing your calling. Hmm. And Fred was actually instrumental in helping the shop get started. He obviously sent people to, to the shop, uh, never had any interest in the shop, never wanted yeah. anything. That was the type of person Fred Zimmerman was. I mean, he was probably the most giving person that you'd ever know, most talented giving person. But he was instrumental in getting the shop started. So, I mean, my father started originally as a bow maker. Hmm. He became very proficient in it in a very short period of time and became the head bow restorer for the famed Rembrandt world to shop. So and he was, opened his, was he still yeah. self-taught? He was self-taught. I mean, the only the only person he will accredit to any, you know, as far as sitting at the side was Al Eisenstein, mm -hmm. who was a very fine repairman in the city. And Al would allow him uh, to, you know, allowed him to watch some of the things as far as bridge cutting, things like that. But as far as bow making and bow restoration, completely self-taught. Mm -hmm. He was brilliant. He really is. Uh, I know he was my father, but yeah. looking at him as objectively as possible, the man was a genius. He really yeah. was. You know? And uh, he just built the business. He worked for Wurlitzers. He opened up his first mm -hmm. shop on 55th Street and 6th Avenue in Manhattan and uh, had a, a bow shop in, in the home in Brooklyn. We lived in the Marine Park area of Brooklyn. And I think it was sometime... He decided that it was time, you know, that the children, we, his children were growing old enough. And uh, he decided that uh, he wanted to move out to the suburbs. And he built the home in Merrick, you know, which is, was always known as Casa Colstein, you know, because yeah. every musician stayed at that house, everything. 
but he, 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 he didn't have intentions of leaving the city. What happened in the city is the building got condemned. It became the MGM building. And they, mm -hmm. they basically, you know, the, the, the tenants of the building hired a lawyer. The lawyer said, yeah, they can't push you out of here. Meanwhile, two weeks later, the wrecking ball was coming through. So this was in the middle of the winter in December. He had just moved into the house in Merrick. And so everything was up on that. And, yeah, you know, yeah. as far as getting that house organized, and then he had to move out of the city. So I remember he basically, anybody that would walk into the shop would give an instrument. You know, he'd just say, mm. take this out of my shop because it was going to get destroyed, the wow. building. And he did leave, lose not anything valuable, but he lost supplies and things of like that that he just couldn't get out of the shop. And at that point, he had, uh, I mean, Chuck Traeger worked for my dad. He was with him. Um, you know, he had uh, Louis Hellman, one of the finest restorers, worked with my dad. He had about four or five men, uh, Gil Solomon, who became the head of the uh, uh, Cremona School of Island. I think he had Master mm -hmm. over there, worked for my dad, you know, so he had a great shop in Manhattan. And uh, he went from a, a four or five man shop down to a one man shop mm -hmm. in Merrick when he was forced to move out there. And that's where he stayed. He built his business there until I decided to join him in 1970, which was about 11 years later. And uh, and at that point, we worked together in the shop, you know, for until really 1978, 1979, just the two of us, and which was great. I, I fondly yeah. remember those days. And, uh, you know, it's something that I treasure those, that period of time. But then we came into the Baldwin shop, and that's when I took over. Wow. You, you brought up, again, many great points, but also for uh, Fred Zimmerman to tell your dad, you know, yes, you're a great bass player, but this is, you're really great at this. And I, I experienced that, um, you know, students, sometimes I have students and they're like, I have to be a musician because this is what I'm doing right now. And, and when they tell me that, I'm like, well, you don't, you don't have to be, you're really interested in lighting or directing or something. There's so many different aspects of music that people can be involved with. And I feel like sometimes uh, you know, we put pressure on ourselves, like, okay, I've been doing this my whole life, so I have to do it. But I actually really love doing this other thing. So I always give, tell people, like, you know, just don't put pressure on yourself. And if you're really good at that thing, maybe you should do that. Well, you know what? It's funny because when I stopped playing, probably in nineteen seventy, maybe in nineteen seventy, I thought it was born in uh, seventy eight. So probably in nineteen eighty, nineteen eighty one. I, I really hung up playing you know completely mm -hmm. and uh and some people came to me who i'd work with and they said don't you miss the playing and i say i do miss it but you know what i'm so lucky i'm, I'm like a member of every major symphony orchestra mm -hmm. and sometimes i don't have to put up with everything that goes on in the orchestra but yeah. i get all the news i get you know people tell yeah. me and i you know you know everything that goes on you know I'm, I'm involved with jazz players you know the best of the jazz players you know, and, and this is transferred over to Manny, too. He's become part of that family. You know, so, I mean, this is a really blessed business. It really is. It's it's the best of all worlds. Well, I think we've all met some curmudgeon-y uh, luthiers, too. And you you are all the opposite of that. I remember my sister-in-law, who she passed away last year, she had a cello. And I remember years ago, because she, she lives in Merrick, and she brought it into brought it into your shop and she was like it was amazing she was like he, he looked like Geppetto and he was like they were like this really great wonderful family and they fixed it and they were so nice so you guys I mean it's just everyone has a great time at Colstein. well you know what it, it reverts back to the fact that you brought up about having that background and my father's saying you need to it's more than just playing the instrument like as you said it's really understanding what the musicians are up about what their life is and and mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the reasons why, maybe this is a good segue at the Musicians Relief Fund, but it's one of the reasons that Manny and I sat down and thought about this during the pandemic, because we knew what, me, I mean, we were going through some difficult times, but we knew how bad, I mean, the rug got completely pulled out from from every working musician. I mean, there, be, there was no venue, there was nothing yeah. to do other than the practice, and then eventually some Zoom things yeah, yeah. developed, you know, the the technology involved, uh, developed, you know, evolved, but uh, it's just, you really have to understand what the, I think part of becoming a musician is understanding what the musicians not only physically have to go through, but emotionally have to go through. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, let's let's do it. Let's go there. Let's talk about the music musicians relief fund. Manny. <laughs> Pressure on me. Um, yeah, that that it was it was a rough time, right? The, like the last year and a half, I think for all of us has been like now that now now that hindsight is twenty twenty, but when you're going through it, for us, we're like, what is going to happen? What is our industry going to be like? When are we going to come back? Um, when will we have in-person events again? Uh, you know, concerts and, and uh, venues and everything. I mean, for I, I, I'm sure for everyone, it has it was definitely a very trying time. Like, what is the future of the world going to be? I think early on, we sat down as a team and we said, we're going to work hard at doing two things. One is to work like there is a tomorrow and we're working towards a future. So we're not gonna just you know sit back and just wait. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is we need to remind people uh, how important music is. And I think that those are the two aspects that we really used in order to get through COVID. Uh, think about tomorrow and to share the joys of music with others. So one of the things that we saw a lot in the beginning was how many of our friends on Facebook and our, our clients had canceled gigs. And in the beginning, it was just like for that month. And then it was like two months in. And then it was like three months in. And then it was like mm -hmm. nine months. And then it's like a year later, you know, and, and they're like, everything was canceled. Uh, and and it kept on increasing. So I think around, you know, May or June. So not, a, not that much after, right? New York went into total lockdown around March 23rd, I think, where we went into a total and complete lockdown. Um, and that lasted into the beginning of April. So I think by the end of April, beginning of May, we're like, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, what, wh how, how can we, you know, fight this in our own way and, 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 and be able to uh, share the joys of music with everyone. So I think that by, by May, we thought of a plan. And then by June, we started implementing that plan. And the plan was to help musicians get their music out there, um, help them to still perform and share their art with an audience. And now we're gonna make it into a digital audience. Uh, a few of the musicians that we were so blessed to have uh, come, you know, were not necessarily very experienced in technology at that time. Mm -hmm. So we had a team of people um, and we had a location. We just finished building uh, the Cold Scenes venue in Baldwin, New York, where right. we have a stage and lights and, and audio and a, a whole bunch of uh, things to have. We, we thought of having live performances. And, uh, and so that was towards the end of the year. So come, you know, February, you start hearing about COVID. I mean, January and then February and then March starts happening where things started going a little bit crazy we said what are we going to do we have this beautiful space that we can't use um so let's let's start let's think about how we can start utilizing it so we started looking into uvc lights we had custom build from an engineer uvc lights to help with sanitization we had uh, a, a defogger hospital grade defoggers uh foggers sorry that would uh you know sanitize the entire room and surfaces and then of course with the masks and the social distancing that we practice we started getting all the cameras and equipment and the sound boards and audio interfaces and all the things that we would need to start live streaming start doing test runs on it and uh i think it was by june or july we started having artists come in and mm -hmm. basically the concept of the musicians relief fund is we wanted to do a a, a go campaign or a crowdfunded count campaign where 100 percent of those funds goes directly to musicians period uh, it, it didn't go towards any of overhead, no, no, no supplies, nothing directly to musicians. Um, and in that time, we had 
a musician come every week to the shop with their band uh, or, you know, with themselves, a trio, a duo. And it was every day for, I think, six or seven, uh, every week, sorry, for about six or seven months mm -hmm. on, uh, and mostly be on a Friday night at 7.30 p.m. And we would live stream the performances to our website, to Facebook, to YouTube, and they would share it to their friends and their friends would share it. And it was just a way to get their music out. Of, uh, out. It was about an, an hour performance each. And, um, and we were able to have over 60, I believe 65 musicians hit the stage. Wow. And we've raised uh, close to $17,000 uh, during incredible. that time. So we were, you know, we're very, very excited and happy, you know, for that uh, going on. That's incredible. And, and then also, yeah, you're providing uh, opportunities for musicians to share music, but also for non-musicians, you know, just music lovers, right? Um, it was a dry, dry time. I actually went to my first concert last night as an audience member inside. Wow. It was like it was um, still, it was low capacity. It was only, I think, 16 people allowed in, but I was just like, it was amazing. And it didn't feel like I missed a beat, actually. It was just like, oh, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. It was, uh, yeah. it was great. I had a recording That's session wonderful. and then got to go to a gig. I'm like, oh, this is great. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, providing music for people. Um, but all, I mean, also during the pandemic, this is when you opened your second shop, right? In, in Roosevelt, Roosevelt, in Roosevelt Field Mall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was in, like what? I think how did you do that? <laughs> was that in we the works before in COVID? No, we weren't thinking of going there. We knew that I, I knew that we were moving towards expanding to our North shore location. And now it's deemed, you know, uh, we have catchy names for it. That's our Colstein North that. location. Yeah. <laughs> this is our, our main location is Colstein South. And, um, and we no how that stemmed out was, uh, I think it, it was around July or August where there's nothing really to do. Uh, there was nothing really to do. And then you, we started walking the mall. Um, I, my wife and I started walking the mall and we saw that there was quite a few uh, amount of people in there um, walking, exercising, power walking. They were, uh, you know, you, it was a way to it was a way to still interact with others where mm -hmm. I think that during COVID it really isolated, locked us down, separated us. And then it was um, a lot of people were missing those kind of having an in-person anything, right? Seeing another human uh, and, and being able to be uh, close to them. So uh, seeing that there were still things in place with sanitization and, um, and capacity limits, social distancing, masks, like all those things were still happening uh, at, at, this, at this place but yet there was still wasn't an, an area where people could come and mm -hmm. and could still um you know still ex search and explore and just get their minds off of things so i i just thought to myself like wow how incredible would it be to share music here as well and then um and that yeah that just led from one thing to another and i was talking to barry and 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 kind of explain to him, you know, what I was thinking and feeling about bringing Colsteins into an area like that. It wasn't so much that it's not so much for the professional musicians, right? Yeah, like yeah. that's not where you go to to look out and search out for them. It was really to reach a new line of people and 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 to and to share the joys of music with everyone inside of there. So we were able to secure a space, and then you know, I think in the end of uh, September and then go into contracts and legal in October um, and then start by end of October start opening uh, have you know everything filled and, and be open uh, we were really well received that area right now has the four the string quartet the violin deal cello and bass on a stand with four iPads where people can learn about the history mm -hmm. about each instrument where it came from why was it developed uh, what's the difference between them and then actually pick it up and be able to hold it and play it. And, uh, and in the background, we have a huge 80 inch uh, screen uh, TV playing concerts and performances. And, and I think that it really is sharing the joy of music with others. And, and a lot of people there uh, are learning for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really cool for us. Uh, for us, it, 
It was more about um, it was more about getting them to appreciate what music means. I mean, for myself, my my teacher who uh, Barbara Tula from East Rockway Public School, she was my teacher from fourth grade. Uh, I met her in third grade until I was a senior in high school, same music teacher. Uh, so it was a very long time through through you know, growing up and going through everything with her. She recently um, passed away uh, about two weeks ago. But I remember talking to her that there were times where I would practice and three hours would pass. Mm -hmm. And I would be like, what? How did that happen? And uh, I remember having a conversation with her about how music sometimes um, just helps us to block everything else out. And you're just focusing on the notes Mm -hmm. And just focusing on 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 that experience and how it's so healthy and beneficial. We have doctors, brain surgeons who oh, come yeah. here and and who say that you know I haven't played in twenty years, but I remember this is the only thing that I, my doctor says. I, him being a doctor saying that he needs to de-stress, and he yeah. was a neuro brain surgeon. He's like, I'm gonna start playing again because I remember that this is one of the things that I did where I, my mind blocked everything else out. And I was just focused on the notes and, and, and just them and making music. So for us, it's really great to see people starting at all levels and ages to pick up an instrument that they've never played before. So that's how the that's how the mall uh, location came to well, be. It's, it's such a gift for, for the public, too, because sometimes I mean, I assume like, yeah, of course, everybody knows what a violin is and the, and the difference between a bass and a cello. But I mean, the average person doesn't because it's not in right. their daily life exposure. And I can just imagine like, you know, little kids walking with their parents and like just catching a glimpse of like, you know, a shiny instrument. And it's what you have both created is like an interactive exhibition. And, you know, most people aren't that giving, you know, like, you know, don't touch, don't touch the instruments, right? Like these are- fragile. Yeah, we encourage it. We encourage it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think many, many's word experience is exactly, it hits it right on the head. Anybody that walk, walks into that uh, the shop and, you know, the secondary location that we have is it, it really is an experience. People just love walking in there. I mean, I get a kick the, when I'm over there. The, I'm not over there that often, but when I am over there, you know, you'll just see people taking photo ops in front mm -hmm. of the, the store. Whoever sees people taking photo ops in front of uh, any store in a mall. Yeah, know? yeah. No, that's that's fantastic. And it's just so many. I mean, yeah, this time has been very difficult and challenging for many reasons, but you both have found a way to turn it around and help people. Right. I, I have to be honest with you. One of the things that will always stick in my head, it was actually the first performance we did, which was with uh, Matt Wilson, RBS and Ronnie Ben-Hur. It was the first performance and we we had our glitches. But trust me, we had Wi-Fi go down. Right. and was saying oh my god what's happening here you know it was like everybody was running frantic but it came out good but i remember ronnie you know we we took a small intermission and we always gave her the band in an intermission maybe five minutes or whatever and ronnie looked at me and he says i feel alive mm -hmm. you know this is because he hadn't played in so long mm -hmm. and he said even though there's no audience here other than the crew the four or five guys that were there you know us running the the whole thing he says, I feel like I'm performing. And, yeah. and that, to me, it, it was such a rewarding statement. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's incredible what you have both cultivated. It's, and I know everyone's thankful. Um, I think that now the reason that, you know, we are moving in a, a different direction with it, right? That ended our last uh, live performance was St. Patrick's Day in March of 2021. Uh, then we said, okay, there's 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 hope on the horizon. There is the there's the possibility of things starting to open back up, and then uh, again, and they slowly have been uh, opening back up in uh, New York City and and on the East Coast, and musicians are slowly going back. But we said, but we still want to keep this momentum going for those places and areas that perhaps hasn't been. So we we wanted to we wanted to hit on this in a different area, and now we're moving into the Coal Scenes Musicians Relief Fund Living Room Series, uh, which we are, which we are uh, so 
we are titling it the LaFaro Living Room Series because of Manny and Helene uh, and who have so graciously supported the Musicians Relief Fund uh, here in person, in person concerts in in the in the venue in Baldwin. Now we wanted to reach out to open the door to any musician around the world, wherever they are, to record themselves in their living room and submit that video in, uh, so that we could uh, do some edits to it and then and, and then stream that performance to others. So we're moving into a new series, a new phase. We're evolving the Musicians Relief Fund to opening it up to more musicians. And we have a really awesome lineup already that, that we started out. Uh, and, you know, we're really excited to start sharing that. I can't wait. Um, okay, I think I have, I have just two more questions. They're light, don't worry. Um, so Barry, and this goes for, for both of you, what, uh, when you restore an instrument, um, uh, what was it like when you kind of first did that? I mean, cause I've, I've read a little bit about like even just basic art restoration and I would be freaked out, you know, to like touch up the Mona Lisa or something. And so what, what is that experience like for you when you're going to restore an instrument? You know, there's no set formulas. I mean, you know, basically, if, if you've done enough restoration, you have experience to draw upon, because there's no way of doing one thing right. I mean, there's certain, you go, you approach a restoration with certain aspects, you know, that are, or foundations, but it's, it's, it's really a lot of jury rigging, you know, as far as what you come up against, because understand something as opposed to making a new instrument, which is really what I consider pristine workmanship. Mm -hmm. because you're working with clean wood you're you're carving an instrument out you're bending ribs you're doing back you're carving a neck whatever it's you're not with restoration very often you're undoing a lot that shouldn't have been done to the instrument mm -hmm. well aside from repairs i mean the easiest restoration we can come upon is is if a base cracks has a new crack in it and that's the only thing we have to contend with uh, which we do do, you know, and that's, that's, you know, that's, uh, I can't say no restoration is easy, but, but that's a much easier premise to face, you know, than having a 200 year old instrument that has been restored and maybe not restored as well as it should have been, mm -hmm. or things have happened to it over the years. And you have to undo that sinkage in the top, things of that nature, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole slew of things that you come up against i mean the one thing i will say is that uh, you never as a restorer i think every every repair person will never have anybody sit in the room when you open to take a top off because it's one of the most god-awful sounds but that's music to our ears if you yeah. if you're taking a top off and there's silence you have a problem okay if it sounds like the world is coming to the end to an end with cracking and things like that that's music. That means you're doing it right. Okay. But you don't want it. You don't want to have the uh, the owner of that instrument listening to that because no. they're going to think that you're destroying that instrument. Yeah. But what completely opposite ends of the spectrum, you're actually opening that instrument as safely as possible when you have that kind of noise. Wow. But it's it's a challenge. I mean, I love restoration. I really do because it's it's. I mean, I just did a major major restoration. Probably one of my most. Uh, challenging restorations on an instrument that just went over to Europe to an orchestra and it spanned about four and a half months and uh, it basically pulled all the stops out mm. you know what I had and I learned so much from it you learn it every time it's even on new instruments when I do and I just completed an instrument recently that I had with the varnishing the varnishing I never do the same thing the same way I'm always mm -hmm. looking to improve but that's the fun part of it and the same thing with restoration, that challenge is, it's like playing, you know, if you were just playing scales all day long, you get very bored of that. Yeah. But if there's a challenge to playing those scales, that's very cool. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Have yeah, you ever I had, think that, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, have you ever had that, oh no, that oh no moment when you're restoring something? Um, I usually, before the oh no moment stops or occurs, I will ba basically step back and I say, we're going in the wrong, I'm going in the wrong direction, or I'm going in a direction I don't want to proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, part of my job, even which always was, and even more so now that I'm spending 99% of my time in the shop, you know, where I was running the shop, where Manny's doing that, bless his heart, 
um, <laughs> you know, now so I can be in the shop is overseeing what goes on. Mm -hmm. I was brought up in a premise because, you know, people walk into the shop, they say, you're going to do the work. And, and you know what? I look at them and I'm very honest. It doesn't matter whether I do the work or I don't do the work because there's one set of hands in the shop. Mm -hmm. There's one quality of repair that comes out of it and that's proper. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether I do it or one of the other gentlemen that one of the luthiers in our shop do it. Uh, my job until I'm no longer here, part of that job is not only contending with what I do myself, but it's over overseeing what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of quote unquote quality control. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that if I could chime in a little bit towards that is that Barry's method and our, our, our method, it, it is it pretty methodical in the sense of really studying what needs to be done and coming up with, uh, with an, with a plan of what to do first and then what to do next. And then after that, so it is, it, you know, it is a, a thought out, you know, planned event. Um, but like Barry said, a lot of times uh, things just pop up. Like we had um, a recent restoration that we completed that went up to a climate that was so radically different. Um, and the instrument just reacted uh, in a way that we were just like, uh, that we haven't seen a a in a while. And, uh, and then, so that, called for you know a different type of uh, restoration because of you know the where it's going and stuff so I think that it is a, a very complex uh, you know it, it's very complex to be able to um, there's a lot of different areas and factors that you have to consider when you're coming up with your approach mm -hmm. you know what Katie I, I go back to Sam and my dad um, he really instilled in me and I think everybody in the shop but he particularly instilled in me that there is nothing that you cannot accomplish. Hmm. And he says, you just have to draw upon your experience, which is basically your arsenal. It's basically, I hate to put it, it's a poor analogy, but like weapons in your back pocket, yeah. you know, that you may never use, but they're there, that you can draw upon. And that's what experience builds. And at that point, as far as restorations go, as I said, there's no set way of doing one thing because wood is wood. It reacts differently. You can have, uh, I mean, people talk about bows. You can make a, you can have a bow maker make a bow out of the same plank of wood, identical workmanship, everything, and that bow will play completely different from its sister bow. Oh yeah, so, yeah. That means the same they're, thing they're with, living things. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you could give someone the same baseline. They're gonna play it completely differently and why does one sound different than the other it's just it's the person it's, it's the people and that's I, I could talk about bass all day but that's what i love about playing bass and and, and my bass too it's like it's not the same every time i play it it feels different which i enjoy yeah yeah, yeah. i have my own little mini climate in here and sometimes it's hot sometimes it's dry sometimes it's humid and the wood changes i love it absolutely um so i mean colstein colstein's Barry, Sam, you are all uh, known for innovation, uh, constantly coming up with, you, you guys do everything yourselves, but I would, just briefly, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about um, the, the Prescott base and what it was like uh, working on that. Well, you know what, the, as I said, Scotty was a very integral part of uh, the family. I mean, George de Vivier brought Scotty out to meet my father, you know, in the late 1950s. Uh, he had just acquired that base, which Red Mitchell found out on the West Coast by Stein on the Vine Music. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where he found his, his Lowendale, Red's Lowendale with a cutaway in it. And he found the smaller base, you know, the, the Prescott that Scotty came out and, and he brought back. And, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't crazy about the sound of mm -hmm. the base brought it back. And, uh, and at that point, he was doing a project with the Shula project with John Lewis, with where they had Alvin Brem, George de Vivier, and Scott LaFaro with three bass players. And he became friends with George. And he said, I love the size of the space, but I don't love the sound of it. And he says, well, I got to bring you out to meet Sam Colston. Hmm. It was an instant bond. My father fell in love with Scotty. So when he had, unfortunately, when he passed away in 1961 in that horrible car accident, the base was in the car and it was very badly damaged, fire damaged, impact damaged. 
it was it was not playable. I mean, the base was basically ruled as a total loss. Mm -hmm. My father was brought to the Wurlitzer establishment where he was handling the insurance claim for the family. And my father turned to Mrs. LaFaro and said, I'd like to buy the base. Hmm. I'd like to buy it with the promise that at some point this base will be made playable again. Wow. My father just never had the heart to do it. It sat, it sat in the shop in Merrick for until we moved to uh, to to uh, into the Baldwin shop, and then eventually got transferred over here. And what tra what really precipitated the restoration was in 1988. The ISB had its UCLA, UCLA base convention in California, and it was being dedicated to Fred Zimmerman and Scott LaFaro, two very special people to the Colsteins. Mm -hmm. And I turned to my father in 86 and said, I think we should restore the base. And my father said, do it. Wow. And it took me two years. It was a very arduous, a very difficult restoration. I basically looked at this and said, this base made history. What my father did to this base made history. Mm. And whatever I can save of what my father's work was, I was going to save. And I went out of my way to to protect the, you know, the integrity of that uh, of the work that my father did. So a lot of the work in that base, even though it's my restoration, my dad has his hands in that. He wow. exists in that base. And the base came back, it's marvelous, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it, uh, but, you know, and in 2014, you know, I made what I call a difficult decision, but a very easy decision. And I endowed the base to the ISB because mm -hmm. I never, I never would have sold this base. Had I ever sold this base, you know, it would, the money would have gone to the ISB anyway. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, that was not money that I ever wanted to call my own. Mm -hmm. And, but I felt that the best way to honor the LaFaro family was to endow it to the ISB and open this base up to the world, you know, and they have, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was originally put up at Ithaca College under the incredible care of Nicholas Walker, who I love. And uh, he has an archive to Scotty, and I guess after the last convention, I think the only reason it came to us was the fact that people were borrowing the base, but Ithaca is so far away from mm -hmm. Manhattan, you know, that it's a 10-hour a round-trip drive, and then you got to bring the base back, that they decided to bring the base out to our shop, you know, that it would be maintained here. We're literally a half hour out of the city, so people can use it. Unfortunately, the pandemic hit, but the truth is with our Musicians Relief Fund, I think a half a dozen people played the bass, utilized it for the performances, wow. fell in love with the bass. And at that point, uh, you know, gave proper credits to the LaFaro family, proper credit to the ISB, and which is exactly what this is about. It's keeping Scotty's name alive. You know, I'm a firm believer of this. There's people in my life who are no longer here, and I'm sure you feel the way you know, your affiliation with, you know, some of your mentors, mm. you keep the, it's, it's, it's an obligation on our part to let the young people know about these people. Yeah. Not a day goes by where I don't, I'm not thankful for the people who have helped shape me and just, you know, none of us would be here without other people's help. We don't get anywhere on our own. No, no, this is not a one way, you know, it's not a solo trip. Yeah. Like, and one of the cool things that I got to witness was last year during the pandemic where Barry said, you know what, I think I want to make a copy of the LaFaro Prescott base. And uh, I, I, you, and there was other copies made before, but not, not for a while, right, Barry? When was the last time that? Yeah, I that actually did a series. I did a series of eight of them. Phil Columbia has one. They're, 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 some are somewhere ended up being used for well, most for jazz, but some for orchestral purposes. But uh, I, it's a very hard base to copy, and I, I stepped away from it after that. But um, I finally called. I made four bases that I called my pandemic instruments because I, when the shop was closed, you know, mandated to be closed, um, I basically lasted maybe about two weeks at home. And at that point, I said, "No one's in the shop. I'm coming in." You know, so and Manny, you know, Manny and I, even though we shouldn't have been together, Manny was up front. I was in the back, or occasionally passed, but we had our masks on and everything. But but being that I had no clients, no no uh, no staff, you know, no business really to deal with, I I actually made about four bases in that period of time, and one of them being a copy of Scotty's base, which is a very special one because it was dedicated to uh, Scotty's sister Linda, who just recently mm -hmm. passed away. Is it different for you, 
Barry and I guess Manny, like you were just making those pandemic bases. It was just like they weren't for any reason other than the Prescott. You're just kind of getting to create with no agenda. No, they were made for me. That's yeah. what they they were made for my own well being. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your sanity, yeah. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, Whatever that is. <laughs> well, yeah. I I I kinda don't have too much to ask. I mean, I'd love to do this again, hopefully in person at some point. But I, I just mentioned, I mean, Colstein is really known for innovation. I love you I, you guys just do it all. I love that. It's like the the bass bib, the rosin, you guys make bows and strings and you make instruments, you have the busetto and um is there anything in the works like what if you guys want to divulge any well, secrets but is there anything coming i mean out? the biggest thing in the works which manny can chime in but i'll i'll mention it is we have our third location that's about to open in manhattan wow which is really i'm really excited about that's it. very cool and you can chime in. You you tell them what you want to tell. Yeah, now you let the cat out of the bag. That's it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're really 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 excited. Um, you know, and we've kept the details kind of kind of tight lipped, uh, because we really want to put our best foot and make the presentation, uh, make sure it's ready to be presented to everyone uh it for the public but you know we are we are really happy of where we're at we're uh right by columbus circle so we're right by uh carnegie and, and lincoln center and and really in just a really beautiful part of manhattan um and we are you know and we're still working on on getting it together hopefully by the end of this month we will be you know set for public eyes is what we're what we're going for but this is something that was in the work pre uh works pre-pandemic and we we found a place and then COVID hit and uh, so that that shut down and then we said you know again it went on this premise of of, of reaching new people and being able to share our joys and our passions uh, for music with everyone and an and easier way for them coming to them instead of waiting for uh, people to come to us. So we, um, this is going to be a little bit more of a higher end instrument. So a little bit more of serious players uh, who are looking for, uh, uh, it's really going to be like an, uh, 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 one-on-one -on -one service that is mm. really custom and tailorized where uh, tailored where uh you know 100 percent uh, of our detail focus and attention will be towards that client so we're really we're really excited about the concept and and looking forward to that opening wow congratulations how thank exciting you, thank you oh wow i can't wait to go there too um okay <laughs> I really appreciate both of you taking the time. I appreciate it on behalf of all bass players. We all appreciate, and violin players, violas and cellos. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate everything that the both of you have done and the legacy of Colstein and, and of your father, Sam. Uh, it's just, it's such a wonderful family and I, I feel like I'm a part of it. I feel very lucky to, you to, are. Know, to know both you of are. you. Um, and it's just so special. So thank you for taking the time. Um, that's it. And more to come i know you guys you're not done yet Katie, a big thanks <laughs> to you for being Thank an you, integral Katie. part it's being such an integral part of the uh, new living room series the musicians fun living room series oh i'll do anything yeah. for you guys yeah you're, you're the best and we enjoy cool. listening to your podcast everything that you do and that you post um you know just know that on behalf of everyone here at Cold Scenes, when you post something, we all look at it. We're all so excited. We love it. Um, you are super talented, and uh, and we're honored to you know to be able to call you a friend of the shop. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you both, and I hope to see you both in person soon. I love Thanks you always. Love you, Katie. All right, I love you guys both. Bye. All right. Bye. bye.